Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, greetings from New York. My name is Manuel Moran. I'm the producer of the Puppet International Puppet French Festival. And I want to say bienvenidos, welcome uh, to this virtual uh, panel, a part of the festival, of the second edition of our festival. We just had a wonderful five days last week um, uh, on site at, here at, in the city, at, at home, the Clemente Soto Vélez Cultural and Educational Center, also one of the co-producers of the festival. And I am so excited and so happy that you're joining us in this virtual panel. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Christine Haverty. She is going to be the moderator of the panel, and uh, she is the producer of the Center for, uh, for Puppetry Arts in Atlanta, Georgia, the largest uh, puppetry center here in the United States, and also a friend, a colleague. I'm so happy that she agreed to do this, and she's going to be introducing all the panelists. Christine? Hey, thanks so much, Manuel. It's such a pleasure to be here. Uh, thanks to the International Puppet Fringe Festival and of course to you and your team, Sandra and Daniela, um, and all of the panelists that are uh, here today. Um, you know, as a producer at the Center for Puppetry Arts, I'm very engaged in the creation of puppetry, but what happens after the curtain closes and what happens after a master retires? You know, how do we keep that history of puppetry alive? And, and museums and puppetry collections around the world are really at the forefront of these efforts. And I'm just so thrilled to be part of this conversation today with some of the uh, movers and shakers in the field. Um, <laughs> so uh, just a, a few things. Um, if everyone, um, we do have the chat box. So if you have questions throughout, um, please enter those there. And we'll also be leaving um, questions at the end uh, or time for questions at the end. Um, so uh, to start off, because um, we do, we have a lot to, uh, to cover today. Um, I am so very excited and pleased to, um, uh, to, uh, to introduce Nancy Loman Staub. Uh, Nancy ran the small puppet playhouse in New Orleans, Louisiana for over 10 years. In 1979, she gave her collection of puppets to the Center for Puppetry Arts in Atlanta, Georgia and continues adding to the collection. In 2009, the center's reference library was dedicated and named after Nancy and serves as a really great resource to scholars and students of puppetry. She serves as the chair of the CPA Museum Advisory Committee. And uh, in 1980, she directed the World Festival of Puppetry at the Kennedy Center in Washington, DC, which included several performances and ex exhibitions of traditional puppetry. She has published many articles about puppet history. She acted as one of the five planning editors and later as a scientific advisor to the World Encyclopedia of Puppetry. She served on the UNUMA Executive Committee, Publication Commission, Research Commission and the Social Justice Commission, as well as the Heritage Commission. Um, and I'm just so pleased she's going to uh, be talking with us today about the Heritage Commission and um, the, that work. So, uh, Nancy? Hi, nice to be here. Thanks for doing this and congratulations uh, on the wonderful festival, Manuel. So I've been working with uh, the Heritage Commission, and this is a report I'd like to share with you. I made this report under the guidance of Idoya Otegui, former General Secretary of the International Puppetry Association, L'Union Internationale de la Marionette, acronym UNIMA. She serves as president of the UNIMA Heritage Museums and Collections Commission. Now, UNUMA posted an address list of 240 puppet museums and collections around the world on its website, unuma.org. The Heritage Commission plans to send each of them a detailed questionnaire and share the results. Raphael Fleury reported that the online Portail des Arts de la Marionette, acronym PAM, uh, under her leadership, has created a database of 150 museums of puppetry and 19 libraries, mostly in Europe. Now, the information has been compiled from exhibitions, catalogs, books, archives, etc. It's in French only so far, but translations are planned. Steve Abrams, editor of the Puppetry Journal, published by Puppeteers of America, compiled the list of over 125 puppet museums and collections in the USA alone. He differentiated between puppet museums, museums with puppet collections, private collections, and those in puppet theaters and centers. The list can be accessed on the Puppeteers of America website. So what is a museum? 
The current definition adopted in 2007 by the International Council of Museums, ICOM is the acronym, is as follows. A museum is a nonprofit permanent institution in the service of society and its development, open to the public, which acquires, conserves, researches, communicates, and exhibits the tangible and intangible heritage of humanity and its environment for the purposes of education, study, and enjoyment. Ooh, that's a long word. Ecom has a study in progress redefining the museum in times of change. Icom posted the statement, museums have no borders, they have a network. The UNMA Heritage Commission hopes to establish a puppet museum network with a newsletter to share links about best museum practices, exhibitions, collections, etc., coordinating closely with PAM. Now there are shared museum challenges between puppetry museums and the rest of the museum world. Prestigious museums, including the Metropolitan Museum in New York, the National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C., to name a few, share the challenge of storing their ever-expanding collections. Visible storage is one solution I have advocated for several years and it's gaining popularity. You can Google companies that make visible storage cases. Of course, museums need to prioritize acquisitions. Strict deaccession re regulations are under review to make better use of storage space. This is a delicate issue with past and future donors. Puppets are made, as we all know, of fragile material. And like us, their makers, they cannot last indefinitely. Restoration is time consuming and expensive. Digitizing all the objects, preferably in 3D, is a logical solution. The Smithsonian Institution is digitizing its entire collection, as well as historic sites. Rebuilding or replicating become possible. Only a small portion of most, if not all, collections can be displayed at one time. Touring exhibits become increasingly expensive. Virtual tours make exhibits economically accessible to hundreds of thousands. The pandemic has taught us that. New tech programs allow the viewer to navigate the galleries and access texts, etc. UNMA USA posts links to many virtual puppet exhibits. One of my favorites is by the Museum of Anthropology in Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. Shadows, Strings, and Other Things Virtual Tour 2019. Check it out. The Smithsonian Institution and others are creating virtual exhibits online with the latest technology, merging images and video footage, interviews, etc. I find virtual exhibits very satisfactory where virtual tours of existing exhibits seem more like promos or substitutes for the real thing. Please share your thoughts and concerns with the UNMA Heritage Commission. I'm posting my email address in case you want links to associations and material referenced in this report. Thank you. Hey, thank you so much, Nancy. It's really exciting work. I can't wait to see what is next. Um, so great. So uh, please, if you have questions for Nancy, we'll do those at the end. Um, so uh, make your notes. Uh, right now we're gonna go on to our first museum. Um, and uh, I'm so excited to uh, introduce Sarah Dilla. Sarah is the museum director at the Center for Puppetry Arts in Atlanta, Georgia. She is an arts and cultural enthusiast who believes that museums and arts organizations can be sites of change, experimentation, enlightenment, and vibrancy. Through her work and research in the field of public history and museum studies, Sarah Dilla aims to encourage public interaction with the humanities and shed light on omitted historical narratives. Before coming to the center, Sarah held a variety of curatorial, collections management, and administration roles in museums, libraries, and nonprofits. Sarah holds degrees from the University of Virginia and Brown University. Um, and a little bit about the Center for Puppetry Arts. Since 1978, the Center for Puppetry Arts has introduced millions of visitors to the wonder and art of puppetry and has touched the lives of many through enchanting performances, curriculum-based workshops, and the hands-on museum, as well as digital learning and outreach programs. 
The Center for Puppetry Arts mission is to inspire imagination, education, and community through the global art of puppetry. I'm so excited to welcome Sarah. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for having me, Manuel, and everyone part of the festival. Um, I am excited to join to talk about uh, our museum at the center, but also to um, start making my path into this puppetry community more. I'm new to the Center for Puppetry Arts in January in the midst of this pandemic, um, and it has been a, a wonderful opportunity to merge uh, my interest and, and, and love of museums with this, this wonderful field of puppetry. Um, so those following the festival and these virtual offerings, I know uh, have heard a bit about the center's history uh, through all of the coverage uh, with Vince Anthony. So I'm not gonna spend too much time focusing on the center's history, but give you a little bit of a glimpse at the museum's trajectory uh, and, and how we are today and our collections today so that we can feed a conversation about opportunities for puppetry museums and uh, subject specific museums, but also collections and exhibitions in larger museum settings. So I think I have some images to share if uh, Sandra or Daniela would, would pull them up. There we go. Um, so uh, having a museum at, or really just a space to acknowledge and explore the history of puppetry and puppet builders, puppeteers and performances uh, was always part of Vince Anthony's original, uh, original inspiration and original intention for the Center for Puppetry Arts in Atlanta. Um, being able to connect puppetry with, with the cultural and historical context um, is, is one of these kind of three critical legs of understanding the field uh, in terms of performance, education, and history. Uh, so it was always part of this intention, uh, but it has definitely changed and evolved throughout the years in terms of collecting uh, and, and our own exhibition space and our own activities and programming. Um, so the museum, uh, Nancy here on the call was uh, foundational to the museum's establishment and the creation of, uh, of the original collection. Uh, it, she donated about 150 um, of puppets from across the world to, to establish an early museum. Uh, and then throughout the 80s and 90s, the center picked up steam uh, in the exhibition realm with creating a variety of exhibits um, that dived into different topics and, and focuses. You can change to the next slide. And I have a few clips from our, our best uh, institutional collections of different programs from past exhibitions. So as the center's collection grew, uh, it grew to show um, the variety of global traditions of puppetry, uh, as well as capturing a bit of what was happening in puppetry in the US at the time. So these are a few clips from exhibition catalogs from the 80s and 90s. Um, they focus on specific cultures, whether it's African puppetry, Indian puppetry, masks, uh, and, and other things, um, specific artists and folks who were instrumental to the history of US puppetry. You can see Waylon Flowers down there in the corner. Um, and then grew to kind of include the, the community of, of puppeteers uh, and, and artists that the center was cultivating and was part of the network at the time. Uh, so there were exhibitions uh, around um, the, the boundary breakers in the field in, in the 90s. Uh, and we kind of landed in 1995 with an exhibition, Power of Wonder, that was was kind of the main iteration of our museum prior to its state today. Um, then by the 2000s, um, the center started kind of considering the next steps and additions to the collection, as well as the larger functions of the center as a whole. Um, and, in, and a major gift from the family of Jim Henson around his legacy planning helped to spur us into a new building and a new museum. Um, that legacy collection is shared between the Center for Puppetry Arts and the Museum of the Moving Image and Smithsonian Collections um, and, and helped us institute 
a, a new museum at the center that is structured around two main galleries uh, and a rotating exhibition space. So if you change to the next slide, these are our um, entrance uh, areas to the two main galleries. So the museum is structured around a track that is geographical. So that's our global collection. Um, it has grown from those initial, in, initial instrumental um, donations from Nancy uh, to be added with a, with a group of um, ongoing donations from artists, from peer institutions, uh, loans, and acquisitions. Um, the gallery is set up um, very geographically and moves through region uh, and culture uh, to look at puppetry kind of across a, a timescape. Um, and the other one, you can see the entrance there is our Jim Henson Gallery, which is set up as a chronological path through his career. Um, I'll just give you a few glimpses of each gallery to kind of talk through some of our collections uh, and, and point out some of the themes that, that these interpretations present. So if you advance, we'll go into the global gallery first. Um, so in our global gallery, I mentioned it's set up geographically uh, and interpretation in, in the museum world is so key to not only the visitor experience and how visitors understand uh, understand our collections and understand how we're thinking about our field, but it's also key to kind of continuing to evolve the historical narrative and and think about how um, how a field like puppetry is growing and also how it's located in a larger cultural context. Um, so here we have just a clip of some of the uh, some of the cases and collections as we start out in our North American section uh, and, and we look at kind of the, the founding fathers of puppetry in North America with items by, by Tony Sarg, Bill Baird, uh, there's Madam from Wayland Flowers. Um, and it, it's really bridging, um, as a gallery as a whole, it's bridging uh, ancient traditions to popular culture traditions. And that's one of the things that I find most interesting about puppetry is that we kind of we can spread such a wide a, a broad um, time frame and um, share different purposes for puppetry. So uh, if you head on down the pictures, uh, here's a, a glimpse where um, you can get a sense of how we're building our collection and how we are. Um, have the opportunity to create interesting conversations around it. So on the left, there's a, a case of some uh, loans and some new acquisitions where we have worked with film studios to um, fill, fill what I would call a broader contemporary picture of puppetry. So looking from the 1980s to recent years at what was happening in um, film and television and in all kinds of media and how, how puppetry was changing and evolving. Um, and then kind of telling stories that bridge international boundaries. So on, on the right, there's our, a collection from uh, Egypt and these are Al, Al Arago's puppet theater examples, which was a form that really um, helped people speak to political commentary uh, and, and criticism of the government. Um, and in the background there, you can see a large rod puppet from Bread and Puppet Theater, which I think is one of my favorites right now uh, in our collection. Uh, and, and kind of another, another example of puppetry being used for political commentary um, and in kind of a, a social history context. So um, as, as we look at this story in our gallery that's divided geographically, there are so many themes that cross the, the boundaries of geography um, in, in the history of puppetry. So continue on. Um, here uh, is just a quick photo from our section that, that looks at um, the vast uh, creative inventions and variations in puppetry from across Asia and Southeast Asia. 
Um, on the left, uh, we have Bunraku puppets uh, that were donated donated by Kiritaki Kanjuro, who was recently uh, designated as a living national treasure uh, for his work in the field. Um, and, and an area where we dive into um, other regions across Southeast Asia uh, and, and shadow puppetry. Um, so divided by, by geography, but um, providing lots of context for how performance uh, is, creates a sphere of influence, whether it's an ancient performance or a modern one that can learn from that. Um, the next slide, I think I take us into the Henson Galleries a little bit. Uh, the Henson Gallery is uh, aligned chronologically with Jim's uh, life and career, starting out with his early works in um, public access television that created Sam and Friends uh, and advertising work, um, and then pushes through uh, to his uh, development of, of many of the, of the central productions that we know from Henson today. So looking at uh, Sesame Street and the Muppets, and the creation of that iconic fuzzy Muppet puppet creation. And if you go forward, you can see, I think, an image in our Sesame Street gallery, uh, which, which ties into kind of wonderful cultural histories of the time of, um, of the television revolution uh, and, and other things happening in popular culture. Oh, I think, can we advance the images here? Oh, yep, there's Sesame Street. And the next one takes us into um, slightly later productions in the 70s and 80s. Uh, and we can see um, the Muppet Show and, um, and as the Henson Studios were kind of pushing uh, animatronics and foam latex and new types of puppet constructions to to create creatures uh, in in programs like the Dark Crystal and Labyrinth, um, and I think that's the the next slide. There we go. Um, so that kind of just gives uh, the audience a, a brief glimpse at our collections uh, in in our two main galleries. Um, if you click one more slide forward, I think there should be a picture of uh, our storage in our collection storage. So um, like all museums, we only show a portion of our collections at any one time. Uh, and Nancy, uh, Nancy hinted at all of the storage and conservation concerns that puppets pose in in all of their various sizes, shapes, and materials. Um, so is there one more slide on there or is that it? Oh, there we go. Uh, so in our collection storage, we have uh, a variety of solutions for storage dependent on size, needs for dust mitigation, uh, and other things like um, foam latex off-gassing. Uh, so there are all kinds of different mitigations, but space is always a, a constrained resource with any museum collections. Um, so I think uh, there are some really fun conversations as, as we grow our collections on the interpretation side, but also in the collections development side, because in, in museums, what we collect is an expression of our values and of how history is changing and growing. Um, and around that, we can think about um, topics of, of what um, something original or authentic means when it's part of a production or a performance. Um, and, and we have to think about our artists more and kind of our, our spread of, um, of representation in our collections um, as we come out of, of an era that uh, prioritized European history very heavily to kind of look at those narratives that were omitted and those artists that that aren't represented in our collection, whether historical or emerging. So just to give everyone a glimpse of the Center for Puppetry Arts galleries um, and um, thank you for joining me. Yay, thank you so much, Sarah. Um, that was wonderful. Um, Great. Uh, so next up, I'm going to move on. And if you have questions for Sarah, again, uh, just add them to the chat and we'll get to them at the end.
Um, but next up is uh, Doyo Tegui. Doya has a background in organizing congresses and public relations. She has organized and participated in many cultural events, and since 2003, she has worked professionally for the Centro. She is director of the Festival Internacional de Títeres de, to de Tolosa and co-founder and director of Topic, Centro de la Marioneta de Tolosa, founded in 2009. She has been president of UNAMA Spain from 2008 to 2015, an UNAMA counselor and president of the election committee of UNAMA International from 1998 to 2014, as well as a member of UNAMA's Publication and Communication Commission. She is a member of the Consejo Estatal de las Artes Escénicas y la Musica de España and of its executive committee. And since 2015 is responsible for the puppet theater program of the Central Dramatico Nacional in Madrid. From 2016 to 2021, she was the General Secretary of UNAMA International, the first woman to hold this post. She currently serves as the President of UNAMA's Heritage, Museums, and Collections Commission. And about Topic, situated in Tolosa, in the Basque country of Spain, Topic, Central Internacional de Titura de Tolosa, or the Tolosa International Center of Puppetry, is a center with a clear international mission structured around four integrated areas theater, museum, documentation, and training. Its inauguration in November 2009 was the culmination of a long process starting during the first international festival, uh, public festival of Tolosa in 1983. Topic is the home to one of Europe's largest collections with more than 1,500 items from around the world. Adoya? Topic is the door. The topic is about to close. The topic is about to close. The topic is about to close. I had the micro not uh, working. Well, um, I'm really honored to take part in this museum uh, panel of the Puppet Fringe Festival. And this was a short uh, presentation of our center, our museum and puppet center. And uh, well, to be honest, honest, I'm a bit embarrassed uh, to be the only one not American uh, here. It is a big uh, responsibility and I hope not to dash you. Uh, to dash. I want to thank uh, Manuel for this confidence and uh, congratulate him for the great uh, job uh, he and his team has uh, are doing with this uh, festival, this uh, great festival, they have, they have, I don't know if it has finished or it is almost going to finish soon, but um, I know it is running for some time and it is been a very, very great uh, success. 
Well, um, you have uh, been very quickly uh, some images about the um, about our museum, uh, and I'm I'm going to try to explain you uh, what is topic and from where it comes uh, topic. Topic is uh, it is a comprehensive uh, puppet center that uh, has its roots in the International Puppet Festival of Tolosa. And next year it will celebrate its, uh, well, uh, the 40th festival, the 40th anniversary. It, uh, it's uh, one of the oldest uh, of its kind in the Iberian Pen Peninsula. And uh, many people uh, ask, uh, ask me uh, why in Tolosa, if there is a tradition of puppetry or how it comes uh, that uh, we have this festival and this puppet center in Tolosa, no? Uh, and no, no, there is no, there is no uh, puppet tradition and uh, none of us, uh, to, to be honest, none of us uh, knew anything about uh, puppets uh, when we started. We were just a non-profitable organization that organized uh, cultural events. And uh, one of the most important events we used to organize was a, a very important choral competition. Uh, that this year will be the 53 edition. Uh, when we started the, the, the Puppet Festival, uh, it was the I think it was the 39th edition of the choir competition. And uh, we, in the organization, decided to organize something else and something uh, that had something to do with the, with the, with the theater and theater for children. Then someone uh, told us that uh, there was a movement um, about uh, puppet, about puppetry in Europe and then uh, we decided to to organize a puppet festival and uh, and in the organization uh, we decided well they decided to to ask uh, miguel arreche that uh, he was fond of uh, theater uh, if he wanted to to be in charge of the of this uh, of this festival or to be involved in on this in this festival, and also they asked me if I wanted to be involved in the festival. I was already in the choir competition, and uh, I, I said yes. I, I would be, uh, I would like it, and Miguel also. And then we started with the festival. The festival was uh, very successful, and soon we started to dream on the puppet center, and with as we have now. I must say that. Um, in, uh, in a way, uh, we have our, our oldest brother, or one of the guilty of, of, of the topic to be, to be true, is the Center of Puppetry Art of Atlanta, because uh, it was an example for us. And, uh, and we, we got to visit the, the Atlanta with our mayor, and uh, to convince him of the of that we have to 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 have a center like this like this or similar to to Atlanta in Tolosa, and when our mayor saw Atlanta, he said, "Okay, we uh, you have convinced me, and we are going to 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 do the topic," and that's how. Uh, the dream start to become true. So, uh, as I said, Topic is not only a museum. Topic is uh, it's a center with a, with a theater for with a capacity for 250 50 spectators, with a multi-purpose hall with capacity for 50 spectators, and uh, uh, hall that uh, companies come to to create their, their shows uh, with two classroom uh, workshops uh, with one online workshop room with a documentation center and a small residency for artists 
uh, leisure space and uh, the museum and um, uh, temporary exhibitions room. Um, our museum uh, started, or what we wanted uh, with our museum, or the idea that come that makes us to 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 do the museum was uh, that uh, we realized that in in Spain we didn't uh, many of the of our history uh, had disappeared. Uh, we did, as for instance, happens in Italy. In Italy, they have a, a wonderful heritage, a wonderful patrimony. We don't have in Spain. Most of the things have disappeared, and, and, we, and this, what it has disappeared, we cannot uh, recover it again. So we, say, we, we thought that it was a pity and that we need to, to have a place where we can, we can collect all the all the puppets from important uh, from important or well from puppeteers that uh, that stop their work and that uh, that don't know what to do with the, with the, with their puppets and and this was the first idea for our center then we we start to travel we start and we know the, the the center of atlanta we know other centers and we decided to 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 build up uh, the topic so uh, our museum uh, has from one side the the idea of of be the place where the where the puppet the the companies or the puppeteers that want to leave their their uh, patrimony, their heritage, can leave it. On the other side, as 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 Nancy said, and I had it in my in my in my notes for today, they they come uh, describe what is uh, the description of a museum from the come. What is a museum? So this is what we wanted to 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 do. What is a, a museum has the part of a pedagogical part. Uh, preservation part, uh, documentation part, uh, all this, all the definition, what I'm not going to repeat what Nancy said, the definition that has I come uh, in his uh, definition of a museum, even though now uh, uh, I come is, uh, is, um, is uh, remaking this definition of a museum. Uh, and um, so mm, uh, we wanted also to to have this part of a spreading the puppetry art because most of the people in 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 our in our country didn't know uh, the puppetry art. The puppetry art was uh, quite unknown. So we wanted to 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 make it uh, be known and to make it. Uh, to have the the place that the puppetry art uh, uh, deserves. So this is uh, one, another um, goal that uh, we wanted to 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 reach, and uh, also the part, the pedagogical part. No, so uh, our museum is not. Um, in, normal between Braggett's uh, museum. It is, uh, we wanted uh, a magical museum, a museum that uh, when you enter, you feel the, ma the magic of, the, of puppetry, you feel the, the magic, the, the potential, the diversity, the antiquity, the richness of the puppetry art. No? So, uh, and at the same time, as I said, uh, you educate the visitors uh, on the puppetry art. Uh, so this is what uh, we uh, try to, to communicate uh, in our museum. Uh, we have a collection of uh, now, now uh, because when we started we have thousands something puppets, now we have a collection of more than uh, 3,000 puppets. Our collection is made uh, of um, donations. Of uh, some of them, we have uh, we have uh, bought them, and um, um, 
um, the most important part of the collection is Asiatic. Uh, we have also an important uh, African collection, uh, European, of course, and not so many uh, American American uh, puppets. Uh, so our goal, I think, is a key. We have uh, uh, many puppets companies from our country, and not only from our country, also from abroad, that bring their puppets to be kept in, uh, in our museum, because they know that we take care of the, of the puppets, and not only this, but also uh, we document them and we and they are there for the researchers that uh, that want to study to study them and also for the visitors to to enjoy them and also when the visitors uh, leave the museum they they are surprised because they most of them they don't know what what puppetry art is and they and they leave uh, knowing a bit what uh, puppetry art is so uh, the the main uh, the main goal that we we had when we when we started the museum we have we have reached it um, we have um, uh, we have an important uh, pedagogical program educational program and uh, well in uh, in short this is what uh, we do in our museum and now if we can see the, the video too, you can see in images that I think is more important that speaking, what is our center and what we offer with our center and with our museum. So can we see the video too, please? doesn't work so I don't know what's happened uh, when we were trying it work uh, perfectly so we should uh, stop it so <laughs> sorry uh, so, so sorry Adoya. maybe we can um, if there's a place that we can direct people if it's on your website or something I'm sure everyone will want to see it so um, uh, maybe we can, we can figure out how to share that through the International Fringe Festival site so that everyone can see it because um, it's just the topic is just such a Beautiful museum, so well curated, and just a joy uh, to to walk through. So, congratulations for for everything uh, you did to make that happen. Uh, thank you. So, thank you so much, Adoya. Uh, and now we'll move on to Monxo. Uh, Monxo Lopez is a museum curator, urban thinker, educator, cartographer, and South Bronx-based environmental and urban justice ex activist. He is currently a Mellon Foundation Fellow at the Curatorial Department of the Museum of the City of New York. 
At the museum, he has worked on ex exhibitions about the U.S. Census, the COVID-19 pandemic, and the Black Lives Matter uprising of 2020. And most recently, he curated the show Puppets of New York. The Museum of New York was founded in 1923, and today the museum's collection contains approximately 750,000 objects, including prints, photographs, decorative arts, costumes, paintings, sculpture, toys, and theatrical memorabilia. Its mission is to foster understanding of the distinctive nature of urban life and the world's most influential metropolis. It engages visitors by celebrating, documenting, and interpreting the city's past, present, and future. Currently on display, Puppets of New York explains, explores the extraordinary, surprising, and diverse history of New York City's quirkiest residents. Jim Henson and Julie Taymor, Basil Twist and Theodora Skipitaris, Ralph Lee and Pura Belpre, Great Small Works and Teatro Sea are just some of the influential puppeteers featured in Puppets of New York, an exhibition poised to bring joy and awe, live performances and panels, workshops and movies to people of all ages. So I'd like to welcome Monkso to the screen, please. <laughs> Hola, hi. Hello. So, uh, yes, the, the first thing that, I'm, that I must say is that uh, I am not a budget expert. Uh, my training is really in political science, so I come to, to the exhibition and to this panel with a, a somehow different uh, perspective. I did uh, do research for over a year and a half for the exhibition, so um, uh, basically I, I have had to become sort of an expert, but still uh, nothing compared to the to the wisdom and the and the long engagement that that the previous presenters uh, uh, have had, I also need to say um, you know thanks to the Center for Poverty Art because uh, they we have objects uh, of the center in the in the exhibition, but also all throughout from the very beginning they were very very supportive of the of our show in in New York City, and so thanks for that. Uh, as, as uh, Christine said, the museum, and do you have the slides there? Are they showing the slides? Um, Are we? There we go. <laughs> there you have it. So that's, that's a museum, and so the museum uh, is 98 years old. In two years, we're gonna be 100. Uh, as, as Christine said, we, we have over 750,000 uh, objects in the collection. And so that's where, where things, you know, <laughs> my perspective comes a little bit different because uh, a lot of, not a lot, but significant part of that collection is really not even catalog uh, at the time. Among the objects that we do know we have, there are a lot of puppets. But we are among those institutions that we are not a puppet museum, but we do have uh, a sizable uh, collection of, of puppets. Can you can you uh, go to the next slide? So, for example, we have I don't know why we have a series of very beautiful Javanese uh, puppets. Uh, the the way that museums acquire their collection, uh, particularly all museums like like the Museum of the City of New York. It's really fascinating, it's odd, and it invites a lot of uh, thinking, philosophical and political, as to how the collection take the, took the shape that, that it has now. Uh, can you go next? And so those are some of the objects that we have. We have very, very old objects, and uh, next, I'm, I'm having, you know, cycled them, some of them uh, in the, um, here in the slideshow. Can you go to the next one? So, because a lot of this, we we don't have really like a good idea of, of what these objects are. We don't know who donated them. We don't know the year they were donated, but we really don't know the artisan. We really don't know um, in what performances they were used uh, or what communities uh, creating created them uh, next. I think that that one over there. So here, for example, it's obvious that that's a pulchinella there, the puppet, the, the head has the mask, and then you have obviously a goat devil on the, on the right, at next. And so, yes, so again, the, the way that the archives come to be and the museums are created 
it's really fascinating. And so I, as, as a curator and a, as a working in a museum, I think that there are two aspects to it. There is the back end aspect of all the thinking that I do about about these matters. And then there is the front end, which is what, what we end up uh, serving uh, to the public at large. And so I, I say this because, for example, uh, it bears some, some <laughs> you know, exploration why if New York City is one of the capitals of puppetry in, in the United States, and, and as per my research, it is probably the capital, uh, followed perhaps by, by Detroit because of the work and the collection uh, uh, of Paul McFarlane, why is it that the city of New York doesn't have a museum of poetry? Why, why Atlanta has the largest and, and most uh, important museum of poetry in the world, or at least in the United States? Uh, when, when asked to my, per my research, obviously things changed after 1978, uh, with the creation of the Center for Poetry Arts, but it is not like in the literature, the research, the the um, academic uh, uh, work that, that it's out there. It is not like Atlanta. It's like a you know, no offense to Atlanta and friends and comrades, but it's not like Atlanta is like you know, wow, um, the the biggest center of poetry in the United States. It ends up with with this magnificent collection. Why? So I, I came to the to the show that I did with with that kind of critical thinking, uh, inspired in the uh, on the work of a of a scholar uh, called Ariel uh, Azule that she Azule she she teaches at I, I believe at Brown University. It's like the idea of questioning why do objects that end up in exhibitions or archives get separated or not from the owners, from the communities that enjoy them or use them, from the people that bought them? What are the reasons why things are gifted? What are the reasons that things are robbed and end up in a, in a museum and so or in a gallery? So I come uh, to this from, from that kind of perspective. One interesting thing that I, that I uh, discovered is that in New York City, we have had for a long time two main old stable institutions with a long engagements with poetry. One of them is Columbia University uh, and the work of Bill Baird is very important there. Uh, Bill Baird was uh, teaching poetry and Mario than making there for a long, long, long time. And then the other is my museum. For some reason, the museum had from the very beginning Puppetry shows, puppetry performances, puppetry workshops. People like, for example, Nick Coppola, who is a veteran of New York City puppetry, uh, the, the director and founder of Puppet Works. He told me that he used to go to the museum and see puppet shows there and that he, he took workshops there. But A, a lot of that is not properly cataloged in our museum. So we don't really have an institutional memory a digestible institutional memory, but rather are dependent on the memories and experiences of people like Nick Coppola. So, so that's, that's one. Number two, it seems, my theory is, that the museum started with a very, very robust toy collection that included puppets. They included the puppets among toys, go figure, and also a very robust theater collection. And it also, brought with it puppets. And so the museum had a very educational, it still has a very educational uh, uh, approach, a very children friendly approach initially. And so while the museum had children, so to speak, at the center of many of its uh, programming for, for, you know, for most of its history really, puppets were there. When the museum starts getting more adult-like and more serious and more academic, etc. then puppets, that's my theory, puppets take go to the background, okay? And so I, I think it's uh, that's, that's some sort of an important co context. The other thing that I will mention is that Nancy, 
spoke about the definition of a museum, but even about that, there is some controversy right now because what Nancy read was is the operating uh, exhibition, or uh, I mean the the operating definition of a museum. But there there is there is a group, there is a movement to change that definition of what a museum is to to uh, stress that they are. The, and I read, I quote, that they are democratizing inclusive and for a uh, policy space for critical dialogue about the past and the future, okay? And so that they have to center also aiming to contribute to human dignity and social justice, global equity and planetary well-being. So the definition itself of museums, including museums of puppetry, it's something that is still up for grabs. I have here Bill Baird because among the things that I discovered while doing the exhibition is that Big Bill Baird uh, was a, a, a close and supportive friend of the museum. And so he gave speeches there, we had galas for him. He left a lot of memorabilia in the museum's collection when he participated there. And so those are some of the index cards that I found in our collection of notes that he had for his speeches and then a very uh, Bill Baird <laughs> type of, of drawing uh, in, in that Manila envelope that actually included the index cards. Next. So we come to the purpose of New York. Then the challenge is how do you translate that critical view about museums, about collections, about actually the history of poetry, like um, uh, uh, Sally, uh, I'm sorry if I, if I don't remember the name correctly, pointed out from the Center for Poetry Arts, it's the, this idea that, that the museums uh, and the history of poetry has not been as representative as it should have been, and this is the case for many other things, but how do we translate all that lack of diversity, all of these debates, all of this critical outlook into a way that A, is digestible, B, it's uplifting, three, doesn't get into the business of canceling people or canceling voices, but actually adding uh, these other, up till now on in invisible layers, adding them without erasing anything. And that's what I, what I tried to do with Puppets of New York. Next. I I basically, this is what you're gonna find in the corridor. Uh, it, these are panels that were, uh, are still at the center, uh, Clemente Soto Valles Cultural Center in the Lower East Side uh, downtown. Uh, that's where uh, Teatro Sea, the, the uh, company that Manuel directs is located. And these are panels, these are paintings done by Freddy Hernandez, a Puerto Rican uh, artist that painted in the Lower East Side the different traditions of poetry as he understood them to be of five regions uh, in the world. So there you have some diversity, uh, uh, you know, a diverse and alternative approach to this history, how a Puerto Rican artist in the Lower East Side understands the poverty agent of different regions in the world. So that's that's the welcoming uh, to my exhibit. Next. Uh, also, uh, I, I also stress out when people come to the ante room, like the main uh, first big room in the in the show, like I, I make a point of, of showing a lot of quote unquote Chinese poetry, because it so happens that Chinese poetry is the second oldest continuously performed tradition in New York City. And so they look like Chinese puppets, but they're really New York puppets. And so what do you expect uh, you know, to see when they when someone mentions New York uh, City poetry? What like uh, it, it forces you in a way to or I want <laughs> to force people to question those assumptions. And so Chinese puppets are New York uh, puppets along with obviously Punch and Yuri and the Yiddish Morico Theater, those and the Italian marionettes, etc., and Manuel Moran's puppets, etc., Pura Belpre, those that's New York City poetry. And so it's it's poetry of color, if you will. Uh, next. And so basically, very fast, I organized the show in three sections. So you uh, the stage, puppets 
in, in theater, the street, the puppets that you literally see on protests and closest to the diverse communities in uh, of the city. Uh, and, and three, the set, the puppets of New York, the New York puppets that made it to the screen or that were used for commercial purposes, advertising, etc. cetera, uh, in, in New York City. And then I wanted people to see, to understand, one, that the puppets of New York are not only about child's play, although they are also very effectively used for that. Number two, that, New York, that the puppets have changed New York, especially by the um, that heavy combination and very long com uh, uh, engagement of puppets with the New York City theater industry. I wanted to uh, people to understand the the impact that New York City has had in puppetry globally. And then a four, I wanted people to see the diversity of traditions, the diaspora of puppets that, that is New York City. Uh, so next uh, slide, please. So here are some examples uh, of what we see on the stage, the Ballard Institute in Connecticut. Another question why the Ballard has such beautiful and impressive collection. Some of those puppets were originally in Brooklyn. Um, a, a part of CUNY, uh, and, and now they are in, in the Ballard. Like, those are questions about the archive. Um, and next, um, there are more puppets. Those are, you know, very well known puppets. Judy Tamor's uh, Lion King and Avenue Q, Trekkie, there. Next, so that's the stage. This is the street. We have an original Jacob Lawrence painting depicting a puppetry show that he saw uh, on in, in Harlem Streets. So we also have Urabel Pre inspired puppets by actually uh, Teatro Sea, Manuel Moran. We have indigenous puppets, puppets done by uh, a black Cherokee uh, activist and, and performer in, 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 in Brooklyn. Next. Here we have my friend Bruce Cannon, uh, director of the, of the Swedish uh, Kodash. Uh, the puppets of uh, bread and puppets, obviously, and there on the corner you have Belzebub, uh, El Diablo, Satanás, a uh, very old devil from the from the Czech uh, tradition, uh, done in New York, and and then uh, Ralph Lee, uh, maestro de, de de Manuel Moran and many others, uh, also in the exhibition. Uh, next, so those are the the puppets of the street, and now the set. These are the like the rock stars, quote unquote, Howdy Doody, Mana Mana, uh, and, and, and Oscar. I, I learned that the Oscar that we have has like 40 years of grime because Carol Spinney refused to allow his Oscar to be ever cleaned properly because he lives in a trash can. So we have it in there. <laughs> Next, is a really... <laughs> and then we have uh, obviously Lamb Chop, like the very existential puppet of John Cusack on, on being John Malkovich. And that little dude uh, there, also from the Ballard, I, I learned during the Puppet Fringe that it was donated to the Ballard by Richard Termini. We all know who Richard is. That's Carby the Carburetor. That's a, that's a, that's a puppet created by Bill Baird for the 1939 uh, World Fair. And so it's a, it's a beautiful puppet, but really interesting representation. I, I did it intentional, uh, intentionally of the work of Bill Baird. He wasn't only about TV, but you know, he was trying to sell cars as well. Uh, next, I think that's it. So yes, uh, thank you so much uh, to everybody. And I hope I, I made sense. Hey, thank you so much, Monk. So that was great. I, the exhibit just looks absolutely fantastic. And I know I've just been seeing so many of uh, my friends in New York posting uh, about how amazing that exhibit was. So congratulations and, and thank you for, for telling that story. Um, we are running a little bit late, but I definitely want to make sure that we leave some time um, as people are able um, for some questions. Um, so if we could bring up everybody back to the screen. All of our panelists. Um, okay. I haven't seen any questions come in on the chat yet. Um, so as we're giving people a little bit of time, um, 
I I will start, um, and and this can be opened up to anyone. I'm I'm curious. Um, you know, uh, you've all spoken to this a little bit, but but do you have um, particularly in terms of new acquisitions, or you know, when you're choosing something for your exhibit, is um, do you have certain criteria that you look for um, when you're adding new things to your exhibit? Um, anyone can start. <laughs> Yes, Nancy. <laughs> well, I've long had a plan for the museum that I wanted to have representations of every possible tradition, uh, the roots of puppetry, because the center, after all, is a center for puppet performance, and that becomes the roots of the art form, and it helps people understand two things. One, the art of puppetry, and two, that underneath all the differences of humanity, well, we're all the same. Puppetry appeals to everyone, and it has so many elements that are the same for empathy and fear and joy and so on and so on. And my latest ones, are the, these are behind me. These are, these are still in my private collection. If you look back there, that one was given to me. The long one is a Chinese marionette. It's the Taoist uh, priest, the, the sage of the South Sea. So that was from the Glenn Paulson collection. I'm very fortunate that he's... He's keeping me company in my 88th year, and so I'm coming to peace with the the, the, the approximate ending. It's not so far away for me. The other two I like because they are from the tradition of Amiens. That's La Fleur and his wife Sandrine, and they were made by Jean-Pierre Fakier. There was a time in Amiens in north of France where there were 70 theaters, but there now is only one. And they're called the Cabotin, they're the smart Alex. And La Fleur, kicks his enemies instead of hitting them. So you could say he kicks ass. <laughs> He's one of my favorite characters. I could pick him but make him kick, but we don't have time. <laughs> He's a marionette who kicks all of the bad people, the liars, the frauds, the, you know, he kicked a couple of politicians too, I think. <laughs> I'll add to, um, to that question, what Nancy said, and also uh, reflecting on Mantra's presentation, um, for in in my view for museums and collection development, acquisitions is is not you know we don't do acquisitions every day. We don't you know we're not constantly adding to our collection as as one of our main things because especially in a topic focused museum where funding is constrained and, and realities of storing things and exhibiting things are constrained. It's not something that we do all the time. So where we do do it and, and the choices that we make, I think are so important to how you grow the collection and they, you know, and they express uh, an understanding of how, how history is changing and how narratives are changing. Um, so I would say in, in terms of kind of thinking about criteria, um, thinking about diversity and thinking very honestly and openly about gaps in the collection and, and the history that's told from your existing collection uh, and versus, versus what, uh, what might have been omitted at that time. Um, and thinking about who's not in there, is it emerging, is it contemporary folks? Um, and you know, looking, looking at artists of color and representations that aren't in, in the collection. Adoya, do you have? Uh, I thought I saw you on well, mute. <laughs> in, our, in our case, uh, well, a bit as, as Sarah said, uh, uh, first we have we are facing uh, difficult times, so we have to survive, <laughs> and this is uh, one uh, main problem. But if we if we have an opportunity of something very interesting, then we try we try to to, to buy it. But um, in this moment, the most important is, is to to survive and to to be able because uh, this time of COVID uh, is a very difficult time for at least for us. So we have to to continue, and this is one of the most important uh, thing. So we cannot, uh, we cannot uh, have a, a politic of acquisition in this moment. In this moment, the most important is to, to have, uh, to, to see how to maintain, to keep the, the, the center. 
so we, we, we cannot, uh, be, there, there are moments that I see, oh, I would like to, someone said, oh, this is uh, on sale, you can, I said, yes, <laughs> I would love it, but we, we, don't, we cannot. So in this moment, we have to focus in other things, so. Someone, someone is asking about the, the exhibition up the, at the Museum of the City of New York. It will be open up till, it will up till April, uh, early April, but there is a companion exhibition um, at the Clemente Soto Veres that I co-curated with Leslie Ash that runs until the end of September. So there are actually two puppets of New York exhibitions uh, happening right now. I. I, I would say that in, in in the museum's case, in our museum's case, uh, we collect with exhibitions in mind. So we collect only what we think we are gonna be showing, let's say, in the next five, 10 years. Uh, that criteria apparently <laughs> wasn't, wasn't up when we, when we uh, inherited or, or amassed the huge collection that we have right now. And so we are very intentional and, and very careful about what we what we collect right now because it's a, a gigantic expense uh, to keep things. But also I will say that personally, I think it's bad karma like to, to, to have puppets there that, that are never gonna be shown. So I prefer uh, to, to to, I, I know that at the Center for Poetry Arts or at the Ballard Institute, that they are gonna be shown, the possibilities of their, them being shown is it's greater. Uh, and, and for me, the, the most beautiful way and the, and the correct way of, of showing puppets is them performing because that's what they were built for. And so I know, for example, that if they were taken into our collection, uh, that's the end of it of them. They're gonna be beautiful. They were gonna be preserved, but they're gonna be seen once in the next two hundred years, and you know that's bad luck in my book. <laughs> <laughs> well, and that that's a great point. When you whenever you do assess a, an object, you're committing to uh, taking care of it for all eternity. So you know that takes time and money and energy and. Uh, so it's it's important to to really be be selective. Um, let's see. Can each of the museum liaisons share activities they offer that address educational opportunities for youth and adults? From Carol Sterling. Hi, Carol. <laughs> well, I I do know that that the museum um, the museum of the city of New York is putting together some public programs um, that are part of the exhibition. I know that uh, Teatro Sean and other uh, puppeteers from the city are going to be part of that as well. You can actually find the information in the museum website. Um, uh, don't you, if you want to say something else about that. Oh yeah, basically one of, one of the engines uh, behind the idea of the puppet exhibition was that um, to serve as, as a place for performance for the artists and performers that were so hardly hit during COVID. I, I personally wanted to spend as little as possible in the gallery, have it as rich as possible, but not to spend a fortune in the gallery so we could use as much money as we could, uh, you know, for the fees of, of artists uh, and performers. I think that that's central uh, behind the the idea of the of the exhibition. So we're gonna have, as Manuel said, a Teatro Sea Chinese theater works. We're gonna have also the Children's Center of Native America, uh, Indigenous poetry doing workshops. We are also gonna have the New York City Kids Project that teaches kids uh, and adults about about different people with different abilities uh, against bullying, etc. So we're gonna have. And, and that's only in the first uh, two months. Uh, after that, until April, we're gonna um, we're we're still working on, on a very robust public programs and educational program uh, schedule. Yeah. Adoya or Sarah, do you want to cover any programming currently? Or I know it's it's challenging right now as well. <laughs> 
Oh, Adoy, I think you're muted. Yes. I have next November, we have a workshop for adults, a puppetry workshop uh, with Alele Cook, uh, 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 Paper Theater. It's uh, from 21st to 28th November. Uh, which is will be very very interesting because you know uh, paper theater is um, it's a very interesting way of, of, of uh, uh, puppet theater and uh, it will be during uh, uh, eight uh, seven days and uh, it will be during the puppet festival and uh, people the um, people that uh, how do you say the students will be able to to see all the performances of the festival and to 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 be during all the festival to attend the, the workshop and to well, to to live the life of the festival at the same time of, of uh, attending the workshops and uh, and then well all the all the regular uh, workshop for children and that we have you, uh, on the um, on the topic this it's uh, the information is on the web of the topic that uh, it's uh, shown on the screen from the center um education is such a big part of uh everything we do in the in the museum and in our theater arm and uh, through our digital learning opportunities and our um, on-site and off-site workshops um so it is it's it's not just through the museum but it's something uh that connects with the museum and the museum uh, also provides its own uh, public programming uh, granted a, a lesser amount during this this time um, but yeah a lot of different opportunities uh, whether virtual or in person from from the center for puppetry arts i i wanted to mention also that uh, one of the things that i that i theorize also about the locations of certain of these very important museums, poetry museums, actually around the world, is that when you have a, a city like New York, let's, let's, let's think, for example, about New York City having a poetry museum. So what conceivably could happen? That New York City, because it's such a large and important cultural center, probably the most important in, in, in the, in, in the Americas and, and center in, in, in the United States, we have this rich, rich, rich ecosystem of poetry, meaning that we would probably end up with a museum of New York City puppeteers and museum of contemporary puppeteers at, at that. While when you have these uh, museums that are located in places that, yes, sometimes are very important, like Atlanta, even uh, Atlanta as a center of communications in, in the US. But still, I think that it allows the museum and the people at the museum and the staff at the museum more freedom to really uh, look at, at a larger palette of possibilities. Uh, the, the, my museum, for example, it's we're very, I mean, we're the Museum of, City of New York, but we're very naval gazing and we, we have drank the Kool Aid. The New York City is the greatest city in the history of the world, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So everything is <laughs> everything is about us, and, and so I think that that it, that's what would have happened probably if we had established a museum of poetry in New York City. While when you have it in another place they they look at other stuff uh, because you know and, and have a, a less biased views less I, have to, I have to say that we have to uh you know like we have to say that maybe atlanta detroit and new york can share the, the title of capital of the of puppetry in the u.s <laughs> otherwise we're gonna have some issues here but um <laughs> yeah we but have a good I think question it's... yeah go ahead go oh. ahead Chris. Uh, no, I just uh, I'm I'm the moderator, so I will I will go on. Uh, we we have a great <laughs> great uh, um, uh, question from uh, Stephen Witterman. Uh, preservation of puppets is a major issue. How can we accommodate the vast number of valuable figures that may not be acquired by an institute? 
There that's are, a big uh, one. That's a big one. <laughs> that's a that's a big question because, for example, now that I've been beaten <laughs> by the by the puppet bug, <laughs> I'm like, how can how can I keep and how can the museum keep being an ally of puppet of puppetry and puppeteers without necessarily acquiring the puppets, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera, but how how Actually, how do we rekindle in a more stable and permanent way, sustainable way, that old relationship that we had for 50, 70 years with puppeteers? How do we do that? One way, obviously, would be acquiring those, those puppets. But the other thing here is that the threshold and the complications because of registrars, uh, when once the museum acquires a puppet to loan it, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, are formidable that in my experience dealing with private collectors there is a flexibility that allows those puppets really to be shown which is what we want and so we need in my opinion like a, a generous private collectors or very flexible institutions that allow those puppets to be shown and preserved at the same time in a place like mine or in the med or the moma whatever they would be behind bars and that's it and to transport it from one place to the other i'm not gonna say the institution but we have one puppet that we wanted to ship from another very important institution we couldn't do it because the da, 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 ended up being almost thirty thousand dollars and so that's you know we with a private collector that's very unlikely to happen yeah, I think I would I would add the um, maybe it's a bit of like a, a warm fuzzy statement, but a old colleague of mine would always say use is preservation, and I think you know we can't we can't rely on institutions to save all history. They aren't going to, uh, and and things will always be missed, and it's just not you know things are. Well are degrading left, right, and center, whether it's a puppet or a building or a whatever. <laughs> so I think use is preservation and we have to find ways to um, document ourselves too, you know, in, in, in our own methods of kind of community archiving and, and other ways to do things. Um, but it, it's not necessarily relying on on that traditional method of everything has to go in a box in a museum closet, you know. Well, this is, I think this is a bit what the uh, topic is uh, is doing, no? This is, uh, we are, well, we cannot acquire uh, uh, all puppets from all companies or from all, uh, but we uh, we receive uh, donation or uh, puppets that they leave in uh, we said in deposit uh, companies uh, leave the puppets in topic uh, we sign a contract and we preserve uh, we document and we have all the com all the all puppets uh, we can do um, exhibitions, uh, we can uh, do re uh, research uh, of these collections, and they, uh, the most important is that they are preserved, all these collections, or, or all these puppets, which is the, 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 the we were worried about all these puppets that uh, were disappearing in our country. All these puppets were disappearing, so we said we have to do something for this not disappearing. So we keep this, we we preserve this, uh, of course, for the, the people that want it, and and uh, we restore it if if, the, if it needed. We can do everything with them except play them, except play with them, unless. The owner said, "Okay, you can." Or came and I want to play with them. So it's a way to keep the history of the puppets and not get lost. All these puppets, or valuable figures for the history of puppetry. And I think this is very important. Of course, 
Uh, we um, we are having problems of space, but we are lucky that our our um, town hall, our municipality, understand the, the question and they are looking for a new space for uh, for keeping the for a store uh, for storage all the puppets that we have many, of course. I I and wanted to say yes. I wanted, I wanted to say that the exhibition downtown at the Granada Soto Vélez, um, the, the lead curator really, uh, was Leslie Ash. Uh, and so it's a, it's a beautiful exhibition. I, I am on paper co-curator, but I, I just learned from Leslie. <laughs> uh, I wanted, uh, well, Nancy, wanted, Nancy, go ahead. I, and I wanted to mention something too. Manuel is always such a gentleman. I, think, I just wanted to remind you what I said in the beginning, that I feel very strongly that documentation and, and uh, of course, cataloging. We don't even have half of our stuff correctly cataloged, just like you do at the New York. We're still struggling and using experts all over the world to help us identify what we have. And so, number one, we want the correct information and then we want that available, but we and we have photographs, but 3D is the ultimate way to go. And Stephen Wiedemann, who asked the question, is also a master of 3D and our pioneer in the use of 3D with puppet performance. But it can also be used, of course, for exhibition purposes. So ultimately, it seems to me it's not a substitute, but ultimately it's digitization and preferably, and, or in a, a particularly 3D dimension uh, is important way for us to share because, well, for instance, you're documenting in New York, all of this uh, movement that's happened in puppetry since uh, we've, we've all worked so hard for it to happen and these great artists. Well, now they're getting old and they have all these thousands of puppets and we, we there's no place to put them. Canada is facing that. I've been in discussions with Canadian, uh, leaders who are trying to find even to establish a museum as you are in New York, wanting to have a, a museum dedicated just to puppetry because these companies are going out of business and all these works are, but it, it may be that we have to let them go. I mean, we let our own bodies go <laughs> and the puppet bodies are going to go too. So we have to keep a record of them at least for the, for posterity. And best of all, with modern technology, we can make it pretty good documentation. Thank you, Manuel. You are a very kind gentleman. Oh, thank you. I'm so honored that you're here, Nancy. I, I wanted to actually follow up with what you just said. And my concern is about the, the, the puppeteers of color, that really the documentation has been very limited. I mean, very little. And it's it's like we, we did, uh, like years ago, it was like we didn't exist. We were invisible. And um, one of the things that, that I am very pleased with this exhibition of, of, uh, at the Museum of the City of New York is that it's really showing that in a city like ours that is so diverse, you know, uh, uh, you know the, the puppeteers of colors were, were and has been and they were there uh, always. And, you know, and finally we have a, a, a platform that, that showcases and, and, and also tells the history about that. So, for me, it's like in terms of museums and, 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 and we need to also be very inclusive and also be careful not to lose that um, uh, part of history because it is, part, it, is, it is part of history. And I agree with Moncho, the whole idea of private collectors is another way. Um, even in Teatro Sea and myself, you know, we have been uh, creating this collection uh, from all my travels around the world, but also uh, from people that, that keep donating things to us. Um, uh, and I feel that that is also very, very important uh, and another way to, to, to be able to preserve some of these, uh, these objects. Nancy? Well, I just want to point out that many years ago, I curated exhibition of African-American puppetry. And we fortunately, several of the people who exhibited also donated the puppets to our collection. So it's uh, we're in, in a way, uh, we were some of the early people to make a point of that. And I was very proud and happy to do that with uh, Schroeder Cherry, who was uh, our curator at the time. We worked, we worked together. We also commissioned two Native American works 
from uh, an, an um, artist from the Northwest. And Ralph Chassé gave us one from the Inuit people. So we, we have a little bit of representation, not as much as I would like, and we continue to try to add to it in terms of the contemporary people of color of America. But in our traditions, of course, we have people from all over the world of every possible color. And it's about time we stop talking about color. I mean, you know, white people aren't white. White's not a color at all. White's the absence of color, right? Black is all the colors put together. And we're, we're getting to all be black one way or the other. Isn't that wonderful? I, I think that the following on that, that it, it's interesting. I was reflecting on, on how the perceptions of what communities of color uh, are has changed over history and, and who white people are, all, obviously, because these are social constructs and how um, when Italians, for example, or Jewish people were still not white, uh, how their their puppets were, and puppet situations were so vibrant and, and as they as, as, as they are ushered or usher themselves into whiteness, those puppet traditions like wane down a, a little bit. And, and how also so many of those puppets are like, for example, the, the beautiful Manteo puppets, I end up in, in, in the Italian American Museum, you know, and the, and the Yiddish puppetry uh, puppets, many of them are still like in private collections. So they never really made it into the like the respectable collections, uh, meaning white collections of the of these important museums, because they were they might be considered white right now, but they were not always white. And and so I think that puppets in that sense can serve also among the many other functions that they have, most, principally uh, you know entertaining us. Uh, they can serve as markers of race and ethnicity in, mm -hmm. in New York City and, and how ethnicity and race have shifted uh, th uh, th throughout time. I tried to get Papa Monteo to give me a puppet. And of course, he, he was short of funds and he wanted $10,000 $10, for one. And sadly, I didn't have $10,000 <laughs> at the moment. And his son, and, and we were friends, and we presented him in, in, uh, at the Smithsonian in, uh, during the festival in 1980. But uh, the point is, when the Monteos decided to place it, they chose to have it in the Italian. In the Italian it wasn't because we rejected it. It's because they wouldn't let us have any. <laughs> they were too expensive. So don't blame us. And we also <laughs> have one, actually. From, uh, we have a couple of puppets from Sicily of color. <laughs> So this, this, is all, this is a very important conversation, and I, you know, I think that it we will be continuing to have it um, for for many many years, and hopefully will improve. I we are now at about half uh, half an hour past our original time, so I do want to respect all of our panelists' uh, time and and all of our viewers' time. Um, but are, are there any final uh, things that anyone would like to 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 share with our audiences before before we sign off? I just want to take the opportunity to thank all of you uh, for accepting my invitation to to do this panel. I think it is very important to continue uh, talking uh, about this issue and many other issues, you know, and for people to know that there are like, you know, so many puppetry museums, so many puppet uh, uh, exhibitions and collections and, uh, and, and in, in many ways also bringing a lot of validity and respect to this art form that sometimes is looked as like a lesser art form when it's not. Um, uh, so I really thank my friends, uh, Christine, for, for doing this. You know, she was all concerned and you're doing beautifully. Uh, Sara, which, you know, uh, and, and of course, Moncho, my friend, and uh, Nancy and, and Idoya, uh, are two amazing um, leaders uh, that we look up to. Uh, so thank you so much uh, for 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 being part of this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, thank you, thank you. Very much. It's great thank day, you. everyone. Thank you. See you soon. Bye. 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 Thank, thank you so much.
Adiós, bye Doya, gracias. Adiós, Doya, bye. Bye.